KC's Audio Vault. Danko Jones. January 25th, 2011. Part 2. Yeah, I was hanging out in my underwear on set that day. <laughs> <laughs> what was going on in your life at that time? That would have been just uh, right when the band started getting going. Were you a uh, university student, a, a dishwasher? Um, well, part of the thing is it, it paid for my rent for a month. Like, that was one of the reasons why I did it. I mean, I did it mainly because I wanted to work with Bruce, Bruce LaBruce. But uh, it also paid for my rent, man, and I was dead broke. So uh, I, I did it for that. But we were, you know, we were just working jobs, trying to tour in the band. At the time in 97, we were hitting D.C. a lot and the Northeast. So we were we were touring we were doing like really skid tours in a van, no merch, you know, playing with the makeup and hanging out with blonde redhead and stuff. That was those were those days, man. It was wild. What were the aspirations at that time? Because you had been together for a while, and from the press at that moment, you 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 didn't really want to even put out a record. Well, that was the time at that during those two first two years. It was exactly our mindset. We were hell-bent on just, you know, just doing, um, we wanted to be on our favorite indie labels, you know, we wanted to get signed to Touch and Go, that was my ultimate goal, because that was my favorite label at the time, they had all the cool bands at that time, back in the, you know, mid to late 90s, all those, you know, Shellac, and, and uh, Jesus Lizard, and Mule, and and uh, the buttholes, well, not the buttholes, because they were suing Touch and Go at the time, but all, all that, that whole scene was, was, I was re- John Boy. I was really into all that those bands, so that's what we were aspiring towards, and uh, we didn't want to settle for anything else. And so we said no, no labels, nothing. And what we did is we just kind of worked our way into that the fabric of that scene where we we networked and we we met up with bands and we we started touring with them and and playing with them. So it, it was it was pretty good. We did a whole touch and go thing at Fireside Bowl in Chicago, where we played with, we are the only non-touch-and-go associated band at the time, and everybody at the label, everybody there, everybody thought we were, we were going to get signed. We were talking with Corey Rusk, the label head. It was, it was almost, from what I thought, a, a, a done deal. I don't know how much of this is going to get on the air or how much is interesting to Power 97 listeners, but, but it was, yeah, that, those were the days, man, when we were just really... It was a it was a naivete, uh, idealism, um, and arrogance all rolled into one. Do you know why you didn't get signed at that point? Yeah, because they thought someone told us that someone. There's a few people who thought we were sexist. There's an argument there, I suppose. There's a huge argument. It's just, it's just a, it's just a tag or a label that's followed us since we've been a band and follow us to this day, and it's usually, you know, put on by people who have no idea what the band is about. Have never seen us live. Have never heard our records. Have never combed through my lyrics. It's, it's, you know, it's whatever. But you know, we do that to people too. You know, I do that to other bands as well. It took me years to get into Radiohead. Because I, th- I thought they were just a uh, just one of these like enemy brick pop bands that you know is being siphoned on us and we're supposed to like them again. And then I heard the bends and oh geez, everything changed. I saw on uh, Twitter the other day you were you, did you get face to face with an old journalist that's been slagging you for years? <laughs> yeah, which was wild, man. Like it was the last place you would we went, we just came and we played at Sundance the Sundance Film Festival uh in um Park City but Salt Lake City Utah and it's just filled with film people you know and we played with Kanon as well he was playing with us it was kind of a ass cap thing so meeting up with this guy is the last person you'd expect you know this and I'm not going to name him but he's a music quote unquote journalist I lo- I use that term very loosely with that guy and he wanted us to sign his laminate that had his name on it. So his name isn't very common, so I knew it was him. And I looked at him, and I go, oh, my God, it's you. And he started shaking because he knew that I, rec- I knew who he was. And then I called JC over. And then we just pointed and laughed at his face because he was visibly shaking. And I told him, I said, you know what you wrote it was really lame. And he goes, yeah, I know. 
And I go, y- you know, we got on the wrong foot years ago. And he goes, yeah, we did. I go, do you remember why? And he goes, uh, I think it was about uh, Lion, because at the time it was Born a Lion was the album that we were on uh, touring for when he interviewed me. And I go, yeah, no, it wasn't just about a line, but you brought up my mom, like in a really kind of just facetious way. And I and I just said, you know, you bring up my mom like that, and that, you know, that's it. You know, I draw the line right there. And he's like, yeah, yeah, he was he was meek, <laughs> but you know, what what are you gonna do? It, it's it's the whole everyone's filled like that, you know. I mean, the whole. The whole scene is are filled with or littered, hopefully just sprinkled with people like that. You don't. And at it. the end, I wrote what I wrote on Twitter. Is I actually just felt sorry for the guy because he was shaking like a leaf, and and it was so obvious the guy's just such a total dweeb. <laughs> There's no sense in wasting your energy and time on that. And I'm, I'm slowly starting to learn that as I'm getting older <laughs> to not waste your time on people like that. So you didn't beat him up. No, no, and I, you know what, I never wanted to, because the way, the, the things he wrote about us, was, it was just so out of, out of the blue, like, we'd be talking about uh, another band, and then he'd mention me, personally, this from a guy who brought up my mom in an interview and, and pissed me off, total unprovoked jabs over the years, in every review of our album over years, just cutting it down, cutting it down, I mean, we find out about this stuff, it's very easy to Google yourself, Especially when an album comes out, I don't care about, you know, disclosing the fact that when we when an album of ours comes out, we want to know what people think about it. And now I just roll my eyes when I see his name. I'm like, ah, right, here we go. What did he write about us now? So this latest album, Below the Belt, he, he didn't even, he even admitted he didn't listen to it in the review. I mean, I just, I could not believe that it got printed. And I told him, and I did this. I sent it to music critics of, who are friends of mine. And I asked them if this was unprofessional, if this was out of line. All of them agreed it was. And I told him that. And he said that he knew he had heard. That's got to feel all right, a little bit of vindication. I have to admit, it felt fucking aw- Oh, sorry. It, it really felt great. It felt great. Well, you're kicking people's asses in the new uh, the new videos. You got quite the uh, cool cameos: Mike Watt, Lemmy, Selma Blair, Elijah Wood. You got the Karate Kid. Are you getting a better uh, video budget these days? Um, you know, no, we don't. I was telling everyone it costs us twenty bucks, and then I started to think, should we tell people that it costs five million dollars? <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, it didn't. I mean, we've been around for so long that a lot of people, the first, for Full of Regret, the first video, it was really done very quickly, and it was really just favors. The second video, though, we had to, uh, you know, <clears throat> pull up our britches and, and, and make it happen. Uh, but the first video with Elijah Wood and Selma Blair and Lemmy and Mike Watt, I mean, the Diamond Brothers directed it. We've known the brothers, the Jason and Josh Diamond. We've known them for years. Um, <clears throat> and when they heard the new song, they said, we want to direct this video. Uh, you know, fates happened where there was someone already on the project, and it just fates intervened, and they got on it, and they just made it work in two weeks. You know, Elijah Wood is a friend of theirs. They got Elijah on board, uh, and... Uh, and then once Elijah was on board, it was really easy to just keep the ball rolling. And the producer was a friend of Selma's. And, of course, you know, we've toured with Motorhead, and we've played with Mike Watt in various incarnations of his band over the years. So I knew Mike, and I sent him an email and asked him if he was in town. And he was shot in L.A. He came down. Lemmy was in town. He came down. You know, it was, it was we could not have planned this. It looked like it was, it was planned, but it was just like... An email here, a phone call there. It literally was. How many videos with this storyline are you planning for the album? Well, funny you should ask. We just shot the third and final installment of this trilogy of videos for Below the Belt. Uh, two weeks ago. And I'll, I'll let you in on who's in on it, because there are enough stars again. Um, <clears throat> Elijah comes back. Ralph Macchio comes back from the Had Enough video. So it's Ralph versus Elijah. Then Jenna Malone, who was in Donnie Darko, and she's in the new upcoming De Niro flick. Uh, she's in it. 
Trent Drank, who is the Capital One Viking guy in America. He's like this known character on commercials. But he's also the lead singer for the Train Killers. And the Train Killers are basically body count when Ice T is doing Law and Order. So he's in it, and we've known Frank for a few years now. Um, who else? Mike Watt comes back. Watt's back. I know I'm forgetting some. Art Sue is here in this video, and he was he's in the Crank movies. And uh, I know I'm forgetting what people, but anyways. Oh, and we're in it. <laughs> and, and for which song is it for? It's for, I think, Bad Thoughts, which is the first track off of the Below the Belt album. You had dropped by the, the station when uh, Never Too Loud first came out, and you were saying that that album, you were kind of going for a, a Thin Lizzy kiss kind of feel. For the new one, Below the Belt, was there something specific, a sound that you wanted to nail down? Uh, we just wanted to make a really, really rock and quick album, like do it quick, like we used to. Like, don't think about it too much, which we had, over the last couple albums, started really thinking about songs too much. Just write a bunch of tunes, pick out the best ones, and just record them. No real thought. And, uh, you know, there's a few songs on there that have a super kiss vibe, which is something I don't think we ever really captured, if we even tried. And when I say kiss, I mean, like, rock and roll over, love gun, dress to kill kiss. Um, so, so you know, that vibe's in there heavily. And But, you know, little thought put into it, just rock it out. Danko, I appreciate we had uh, a nice long chat today, and uh, we will see you tonight. Danko Jones playing at Silverado. Thanks again for the phone call. All right, thanks, Casey. All the interviews you want on iTunes and at Power97.com. Casey's Audio Vault. Casey Norman is Power97's music director and can be heard every weekday from 2 till 6 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Power97 is Winnipeg's best rock.